Good morning, and welcome to the Cathedral of Our Lady of Victory as we celebrate the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. And friends, we gather here in this cathedral and those joining us on television to celebrate and to witness these sacred mysteries of God, the presence of God among us. So let's prepare our hearts and our souls. Let us ask for the forgiveness of our sins. I confess, O oh my God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask the Blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me, the Lord our God. May the Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen.
and let us pray. O oh God, from the abasement of your Son, have raised up a fallen world. Fill your faithful with holy joy, for on those who be rescued from slavery to sin, you bestow eternal gladness. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. And as the Lord spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard the one who was speaking say to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have revolted against me to this very day, hard of face and obstinate of heart, are they to whom I am sending you, but you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God, and whether they heed or resist, for they are a rebellious house, and they shall know that a prophet has been sent among them. The word of the Lord. Reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, that I, Paul, might not become too elated because of the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I would rather boast most gladly of my weakness in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. Therefore, I am content with weakness, insults, 
hardships, precautions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks. The Lord be with you. And with Reading the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath day came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They said, Where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hand? Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brothers of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his native place, and among his own kin, and in his own house. So he was not able to perform any mighty deeds there, apart from curing a few sick people by laying hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Our Gospel today begins the sixth chapter of Mark and is the Gospel chosen for this 14th Sunday in ordinary time. And it begins with these words Jesus departed from there and came to his native place. Now, it would be interesting for us to know exactly where Jesus is going from and where he's going to. Obviously, he's going home, back to Nazareth, back to the house of Mary. But where does he leave? What place does he depart? It's it's important, I think, to us to understand that because it gives us deeper insight again into this very gospel. So we know very well where Jesus is leaving. It's that seaside shore, that seaside town on the shore of Galilee. In fact, for the last few Sundays, he's been in that town and he's been preaching and teaching in that town and is not met with a whole bunch of success. And so Jesus decides to go back to his native place. You see, remember that town? It's the town where Jairus lives. Jairus is the synagogue official who had a young daughter who was at the point of death. And Jairus, when Jesus arrives there the second time, begs Jesus to come home and cure his daughter. And everyone thinks that she is dead, but Jesus sees something different. He sees her alive, as we heard in last week's gospel. He reaches out his hand, he touches her, and she is risen from the dead. It's the same place with that woman, that woman, the one who has been bleeding for the last 12 years. She also lives in that place. She's the one who was bold, who reached out amongst the crowd, found her way in, and just grasped the hem of Jesus' garment. And that was enough for her. She had that kind of faith that Jesus was hoping they all would have in that place. She just knew if she could just get that close to Jesus, all would be well and all would be right. And sure enough, it was. See, it's that same town where the weeks before Jesus was already preaching and teaching. And so we had to go back a second time to show him in those miracles that which he gave them in parables. He told them the kingdom of God is unknown to us in a way, and yet it's ever present to us. The parable is like a seed a farmer goes out and plant in the soil and it sprouts and it grows, the rains come and go night and day. You know not how and yet the seed sprouts and Jesus was trying to get the oppress upon them. That is the kingdom of God. It's bigger than you can ask or imagine. He told them this parable of the mustard seed. They said it's a really a weed, and it's, but yet when it's placed in God's care, 
when it's healed like the woman with the hemorrhage and the little girl who was dead, those who are on the outside, when it's fully incorporated back into God's kingdom, then it produces shade and a bush and gives refuge to some. You see, it was that town that Jesus says, enough, let me go home. Enough, let me go back to my native place. You see, we, only can, we can only speculate, but I think what was happening in that moment, Jesus was just a little bit exasperated. Even with his own disciples, his inner circle, they had missed all the teachings of the parable and the miracles as well. You see, I think Jesus is having what I would call an Ezekiel moment. Ezekiel, from the first reading today, is a prophet. Ezekiel, in our first reading today, is being commissioned by God. God is sending him to the Israelites. He's going there because the Israelites have become a rebellious nation. They have struck out on their own. They have tried to renegotiate and redefine their terms with God's covenant. And because of this, they were wandering far, far away. But God would not leave them alone. That's how God was deeply in love with his people. And so he commissions Ezekiel. He says, now you have to go to them. And it's going to be difficult because they are hardened of heart. But your job is to woo them back into the great love of God and to reestablish my covenant with them. It's going to be difficult. And he says, and even if they do not understand, at least they will know that God was with them even in their rebellion. Isn't that a compassionate and merciful God who goes after us even when we go off by ourselves? You see, that I think was Jesus' frustration. He was realizing that spreading the kingdom of God was not as easy as he had thought. Perhaps and people were not catching on as quickly as he hoped. Have you ever had those kind of moments? Those Ezekiel moments in your own life where you've done everything right and everything should be going a certain way and yet it has gone south. I hear it oftentimes, unfortunately, not just in my own life, but in lives of others. Here's my most common one I hear. Usually I hear it from parents. They say, Father, I don't know what happened. I did everything right for my children. I raised them in the faith. I took them to church on Sunday. I gave them all their sacraments. I sent them to the Catholic school, the religious education program. And now when they're, in, they're gone off to college, they stop going to mass on Sunday. They've become rebellious children. And I have to caution them, this happens. Lead them by word and example back to the goodness of the faith. You see, have you ever had those kind of Ezekiel moments where all you wanted to do was go home back to your own mother's house, back to that place of comfort and rest, take a little vacation from the weariness of the world and just sit again at the table with your family, surrounded by people you love. I suspect that's why Jesus goes back to his native place. And who wouldn't, right? Who wouldn't go sit with the Blessed Mother at her table? If anyone could Jesus could commiserate his life and his, his wonders, it had to be her. Mary, who had her own encounters with God and knew the mysterious ways of the Almighty. What a wonderful sight it must have been for Jesus, right? To sit there on the table with Mary, have his blessed mother fix him one of his favorite dishes and tell him all about the adventures he's already had, spreading the good news of God's salvation. It's a wonderful image. And sometimes I think we long to do just that, to go back home to our own mother's house, be nourished again with the goodness of love. So Jesus, after having sat there at Mary's table, he decides to go to the, to the synagogue. After all, it's the Sabbath day, and being a preacher and a teacher and a rabbi and the Son of God, it makes perfect sense. So off he goes to the synagogue. Now in, Matt, in Mark's gospel, we're not told what he preaches, but you have to go to Luke's gospel for this. And in Luke's gospel, he's handed the prophet Isaiah, and he finds a place where it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has sent me to bring good tidings to the poor, to declare a year of favor from God, a release from prisoners and captives. And as Jesus preaches his little sermon on that particular prophecy, the people in his hometown are amazed. We hear it today. They say, where did this man get all this? What mighty deeds are these performed? What wisdom has been given him? They're amazed at his eloquence and how much he knows and he understands. They are surprised by his grace. And then, as the gospel says, Jesus rolls up the scroll, he hands it back to the attendant, he sits down, and he makes one last utterance. He tells them, today, this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. And that sentence changes everything. That sentence pricks them in such a way that they can hardly take it in. 
they know that that kind of language means that he was ushering in the kingdom of God, precisely for what he has come to do, even to his hometown, and yet they can't grasp it. How could he usher in the kingdom of God? And they begin to ask themselves, well, who does he think he is? Is he thinks he's the son of God? I mean, we know him, right? There, he's, he's the carpenter's son. Joseph was his father. He worked in his shop. And Mary there is his mother. We watched him ra be raised in this town. He went to school with our kids. He played Little League with our kids or whatever they played in those days and times. You know, we saw him come up. We know who he is. Look, here's his relatives. Here's his cousins, J James and J Judas and, and his girl cousins. They're all here together. We know him. Who does he think he is calling himself fulfilled in your hearing, the Son of God? It's too much for them. They can't quite grasp it. See, the disciples couldn't get it when he was on that other place that he left from. And now it seems even those who are closest to him, even those who he was raised with, still can't quite put their head around that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is our Savior. You see, the problem is this. He's just too familiar. You know the, the old expression, familiarity breeds contempt? This is a clear example. He's just too familiar. We know who Jesus is, and there is no way possible that God can work through Jesus. There's no way possible that those, those people of his native place are thinking that he can't possibly be the Son of God. And yet, you and I know he is the Son of God. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is our Savior. And he certainly is ushering the kingdom of God in. You see, sometimes things become so familiar we overlook them. We ourselves become those rebellious people going against God. See, we think to ourselves, like, we know God. We've got God all figured out. And the minute you think you have God figured out, watch it. Because God will do something different, something bold, something new. See, we can say some things about God, but we can't say everything about God. And just when we think we have put God in a box, well then, he comes to us in a new and a startling and usually a very simple way. He comes to us as some, someone or something or some experience that we could never ask or imagine would mitigate and give to us the grace of the Almighty. You see, oftentimes it's this. Oftentimes we get so familiar with the presence of God, even in our own life, Emmanuel, God with us, God always with us. Sometimes we take God's presence in our life so for granted that we begin to conform God to our lives instead of conforming our lives to God. And that's where we go wrong. That's where we always make a mistake, when we want to tell God, be like us, instead of we striving to be more and more like God. See, it's not lost on me that on this 4th of July weekend, this Independence weekend, that sometimes we do this even with our own native place, even in our own country, that sometimes we forget that we were founded on Judeo-Christian roots, that the principles of God, those inalienable rights that are enshrined in our Constitution, they're not there because of the Constitution, but they're there because they are from God and God alone, and our Constitution just holds them up for us and lets them see them. And yet sometimes, because God is so familiar to us, we begin to conform God to us instead of conforming our lives to God. Think of this, these unalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Think of the sanctity of human life. It is the very principle of God enshrined in our Constitution, and yet oftentimes, oftentimes, we begin to control or think we have control over life itself. Think of this, why is it that we have capital punishment? Why is it that we think we have the power to put to death criminals and call it the name of justice when isn't the justice of God always been mercy? And why is it in the name of liberty and freedom we allow abortion to be the law of the land and we call it a choice? See, we have trying to conform that sanctity of life according to our lifestyle instead of being raised up to the God who is ever familiar with us and say, no, life is sacred from its moment of conception until its natural end. Look at the institution of marriage. Marriage, it was with us from the beginning. In the divine image, God made them male and female, he made them. That is why a man leaves his wife, uh, leaves his family and clings to his wife and the two become one flesh. It's a divine institution and no court or no legislator should rewrite that 
that sacred bond between one man and one woman for the duration of their lives. And yet we try to conform our lives to God's life. To, we try to conform God to our life instead of so trying to conform our life to God. You see, God is just so familiar to us that sometimes we just take him for granted and we begin to think that we are in charge. Now there's a remedy for this, a way for us to learn the humility it takes to be God's children, and that is gratitude. To remind ourselves that all that we have, all that we are, all that we ever will be comes from God and God alone. All those Ezekiel moments when life is difficult, it's the grace of God at work. And all those joyful celebrations where we sit at our mother's tables rejoicing, it's the grace of God at work. And in all times, in all places, in all circumstances, we should just give thanks to what God has done for us. We could start today, on this Independence Day, being grateful for our country. That we live in this land of the free and the home of the brave. And there are millions around the world who would die to live in this town, in this place, in this country where you and I live so freely. That we have these rights that are enshrined in our Constitution. That we have the ability to gather, to assemble, to let our voice be known, to pray as we choose to pray and not be controlled by a government. See, these are things that we should be deeply grateful for and that we should strive to make our country even more and more in the image of God. Be grateful for your family that are given to you as gift. Be grateful for the air that we breathe and the, and, the, and the food that we eat, all these simple things we take for granted, and yet, familiar as they are, they are gift to us from God. Be grateful for this Eucharist, this very bread of life. Be grateful for that something so familiar, bread and wine, something most of us have in our kitchens right now, but here in this place, that bread and that wine will be so consecrated that it will not become ordinary, but extraordinary. It will be the body and blood, the soul and divinity of God. And we'll receive that Eucharist into ourselves, into our own homes, and God will once again come home to his native place in ourselves so that we can conform ourselves more likely to God. Be grateful. Be grateful for all the good things that God has made us. Look and see the presence of God. Let us be faithful people, so in God's company, amazing things may be done, and there will not be a lack of faith, because we have seen God, and we have known God, and we have loved God. So together now, let us profess our faith. I believe in one God. With gratitude for all God's gifts, and let us turn to him now with all our needs. For the church, may we be a consistent witness to the world of our faith as we strive to be welcoming communities united in truth and love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. 
for our country on this anniversary of its independence. May we truly live up to the values on which it was founded, establishing justice for all, promoting the general welfare, and securing liberty for generations to come. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the elderly and those with disabilities, may they find Christ's power in their weakness and receive Blessed Mary's motherly consolation. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an increase in vocations to holy orders and holy matrimony, may we have the courage to seek God's will above our own and to love our spouses with his sacrificial love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the repose of the soul of David and Ralph Loach and Jeremy Kotzer, and for all the faithfully departed, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the needs listed in our parish intention book and for those we hold in the silence of our hearts, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Gracious and merciful God, hear us now as we lift our prayers before you. Answer them, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
And pray, friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May this oblation, dedicated to your name, purify us, O Lord, and day by day bring our conduct closer to the life of heaven through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and ever to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by his birth he brought renewal to humanity's fallen state, and by his suffering canceled out our sins. By his rising the dead he has opened the way to eternal salvation, and by ascending to you, O Father, he has unlocked the gates of heaven. And so with the company of the angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise, as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and you make them holy. And you never cease to gather people to yourself, but from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have bought to you for consecration that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which we poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O oh Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church in recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us the eternal offering to you, so that we may attain an inheritance of your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. 
be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant Francis, our Pope, and Brennan, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you gain for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you summon before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, who are pleasing to you with their pastoring this life, give kind amendments to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, to whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And now at the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Grace you grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may always be freed from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who set your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sin, but in the faith of your church. And grace you grant our peace and unity in accordance with your will to live and reign forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called the Supper of the Lamb. Lord,
Let us pray. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that having been replenished by such great gifts, we may gain the prize of salvation and never cease to praise you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord be with you. And may the Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, our Mass is ended. Thanks be to God.